<clears throat> I love this year's topic. Um, the manifesto captures the duality of technology and the people that use it. But I think like most of us, it makes the assumption that technology is amoral and that it all depends on how you use it. Technology can definitely be moral or immoral just by the nature of its function. But I'd actually like to talk about that. So let me just put my slides up. Okay. Everyone see the slides? Great. I believe we are becoming so integrated with technology that we are losing our ability to objectively judge technology. Good and evil are becoming more and more blurred as our online world and offline world start to become indistingu indistinguishable from one another. Our free will is becoming compromised as we let technology direct us more than we direct it. We are starting to think like the internet and we are starting to act like the machine. Um. Sorry, I'm going to try and full screen this because I don't think it's full screen, is it? Hmm. Good. All right. Yeah, awesome. Okay, it's, it is full screen. Great. Sorry about that. Okay. The digital totality is indeed upon us, and we must remember that with every extension, there's an amputation. There is no innovation that does not take something away from us. Let's look at something as seemingly basic as writing. Socrates tells us the story of an Egyptian god who visits King Thamus. The god praises the art of writing, but the king expresses concern. They will cease to exercise memory because they will rely on that which is written calling things to remembrance, no longer from within themselves, but by the means of external marks. They will have an appearance of wisdom, while for the most part, they will know nothing. Writing down information is a relatively new innovation. People used to store everything they needed in their memory. The giant books that hold stories like the Iliad and Odyssey were, neat, uh, were verbally transmitted from person to person. They had meaning, were internalized, and digested, and memorized using algorithmic rhyming schemes, which is something almost unimaginable to us today. We automatically assume that if these stories were never written down, we would not have them today. But it's the opposite that's true. They are no longer, um, <clears throat> it's the opposite that's true. No one can recall these stories from memory anymore because they were written down. They are no, lo no longer internal or part of us. They are outside of us. That is the amputation. I guess the uh, extension is you can now follow Homer. The modern example of this loss of memory is when scientists used MRIs to study the brains of successful London cabbies who had memorized extensive driving routes around the city. They found a visible increase in the size of their hippocampus. This is not present in cabbies that failed the exam or in regular people that rely on GPS. But the criticism here goes beyond becoming forgetful. If we do not remember things, we do not truly absorb and process them. Information is no longer an authentic part of us. It is outsourced, glanced at in times of need or want. Information becomes shallow, and so do we. Information is power, but only if it's processed, only if it's good information, only if we know what to do with it, and only if we actually do something with it. 
we have too much information. This makes things simultaneously overwhelming and irrelevant. The higher the number of deaths, the harder it is to empathize with those deaths. Too much information also leads to distraction. Deep, uninterrupted intake of even good information has become difficult. If you read a document with hyperlinks, you actually score lower in comprehension because you overload your working memory. It's hard to remember things because there are too many things to remember. And as we discussed earlier, if you can't remember something, can it really have meaning? We are suckers for relevancy, as Clifford Nass put it. When the printing press was invented and we had the first major explosion of publications, serious authors warned us about the dangers of garbage content. I wonder what they would think of the content we have today. And I wonder what the average person from the Middle Ages would think of the average person today. We have all the information at our fingertips, and the majority of us do absolutely nothing with it. Too much information actually subverts and pacifies. Just think of an event, social movement, or even war that the media has covered endlessly. Especially with the age of social media, this extensive coverage of an event neutralizes us to its significance. Also, today we are less likely to actually do something useful with the information we have because passing on or posting the information makes us feel like we already did something. So Socrates warned, remembering has been replaced by writing. Now writing is being replaced by typing. We aren't even teaching kids to write in cursive anymore or write at all in some cases. It is important to understand that when there's an innovation it does not just add or improve something. It usually replaces something, at least in part. Let's look at something that may seem benign. The front-facing garage door. This is how the majority of American houses are built today. The small, this small design change um, drastically shifted the way people interact. It replaced the front porch where people would congregate, be visible, be social, and keep an eye on the neighborhood. We sacrificed all that for the perceived needs of our cars. The front-facing garage continues to shape a huge part of our daily interactions or, the, or lack thereof. Communication media is doing something similar. It is replacing in-person interactions. How many of us have seen Couples at a nice dinner, staring at their phones the entire time. Actively allowing software to collect information about the dinner they're not actually having. Actively allowing the machine to use them. How often are we more concerned about taking a picture than enjoying the view? Or of our food? Or the people around us? We are killing being of the moment. We are killing passion. We are becoming predictable, programmable. We are becoming more like the machine. Facebook, Twitter, Zoom, FaceTime all allow us to have relationships online, even with people we've never met. They allow us to keep up with family and friends that are far away. Obviously, it's not black and white. After all, I am taking part in this. I am participating in Hackers Congress remotely over media communication, and I would not be able to speak this year if I could not do it remotely. But media communication, ironically, has various isolating effects. Too often, it does not supplement our relationships, but instead replaces them. If you are very shy and anxious and the internet allows you to have a community without ever leaving your house, is it improving your life? Or is it replacing the opportunity for a real community or real friends? If you have a grandparent living, in a, uh, living a few hours away, is calling them a wonderful thing? Or is the ability to call them excusing you from having to go see them as much? Or what about a dying relative in a hospital that has COVID? Is it a blessing that you are able to Zoom with them before they die? Or is it a way to make it more acceptable for you when the hospital denies you visitation rights? How many elderly people died from neglect this summer? How many babies were born this year that haven't been held by anyone except their parents? How many people watched a funeral, a wedding, a birthday over video chat this year? 
Is this a temporary measure? Or are we now more tolerant of abandonment, neglect, and hostage situations because we can see each other on screens? Are we tolerating more and more control? Is this technology empowering us or is it pacifying us? We have recently learned that the consumption of porn rewires our brains. There are studies after studies that show this, but some of us already knew this. Porn is a weapon and it was used as a weapon before any such studies came out. Apart from burning out your dopamine, dopamine receptors and such, porn is a great demoralizer, demoralizer and pacifier. When Israel would take over towns in Palestine, like the town of Ramallah, they would start bro broadcasting porn onto its captive citizens as a means of subverting them. Today, porn consumption is at an all-time high. We are reached inside of our own homes with no friction and no resistance. Do we just not notice all the negative effects? How is that possible? Well, if you grew up on the internet, it is likely you grew up on porn and your brain grew with it. You were used and shaped by the graphic images you viewed. You had zero reference point, especially if you were a kid. There was no concept of good and evil. There was only how often and which website. It changes your brain, which changes your mood, your behavior. It steals your time, makes you less productive and less interested in actual intimacy. But it's more sinister than that. Today, we have a society where porn is more real than actual sex. More people consume porn than participate in intercourse. And when, you, when they do have sex, they act out what they saw in porn, which are often things of a degrading and violent nature. And this is happening at a younger and younger age. This is what Baudrillard called the hyperreal, something fake, the simulation of sex, is acted out in real life to the point of being indistinguishable from real life. One of the most basic human things, sex, no longer comes from within us, but is taught to us by the machine. The inoculous sounding screen time is making kids less human. We have these networks called mirror, neuron, mirror neurons that enable us at a very young age to mimic facial expressions by which we develop empathy. Long-term pacifier use has been shown to restrict empathy in, develop, in the development of boys. This is because when a little boy is sucking on a pacifier all the time, he cannot properly mimic the facial expressions of others. This stunts his ability to empathize. Now imagine a whole generation of kids who are staring at screens constantly. We see this at parks and playdates around family. The children are glued to flat moving images instead of physically playing. Their movements are guided by the touch screens and their mind is transfixed. Time spent on a screen is time spent away from family, friends, and away from eye contact. There may also be advertising, but even if there isn't, they're still gathering information on how your child interacts with the device, the app, the video. Your kid is the product, and unlike you, they had no choice. Then there's the issue of content. Do we all remember the YouTube kid scandal? Parents would allow their kids to freely explore YouTube on the kids setting. Assuming this techno oligopoly cared about your kids enough to make sure they could only see safe content, but as it turns out, they don't care at all. In fact, the content was arguably worse than anything I've ever accidentally stumbled upon regular YouTube. Channel farms in places like Spain, India, Russia were putting out dystopic and quite horrifying videos made by AIs targeted at kids all for views. There were uh, themes of violence, rape, kidnapping, injury, all done by your kids' favorite superheroes and Disney characters. There were also channels run by ex-porn stars, which may explain some of the more sexual themes. Even if YouTube kids only had good content, giving a small child the power to watch short videos on demand is incredibly overstimulating and rewires the brain in a similar fashion as porn does in adults. It decreases the ability to pay attention, which decreases the ability to memorize. And again, it replaces human interaction. 
all of this was viewed as hysterics, but now the studies are coming out and they are not telling us anything that wasn't already reasonable to assume. Something I find to be revealing is that many people who are incredibly tech savvy, the very people that make the technology the majority of us use, tend to interact with it cautiously. They make sure to spend enough time off the computer. Some go as far as to severely limit the time their children spend on devices. Not long ago, the restrictive attitudes of tech CEOs at corporations like Apple and Google made news. They revealed that in their home, smartphone use, smartphone use was discouraged and even outright banned. Some Silicon Valley elites specifically picked device-free private schools for their children. After Nietzsche became progressively more sick, he ordered a typewriter so he could keep working. After writing some letters to his friend Heinrich Koselitz, the friend remarked how Nietzsche's writing has become tighter, telegraphic, and more forceful, like the iron of the machine. As though the, um, as though the typewriter itself was metaphysically transferred onto the page. Nietzsche went on to say, our writing equipment takes part in the forming of our thoughts. Next time you use a computer or a phone, remember that the very act changes the way you operate. Next time you consume information online, remember that it consumes you. The digital totality is upon us, but it's not something we can be ready for. It's not something that is happening to us. It's something that is happening with us. Machines are not becoming more human-like. It is humans that are becoming more, machi more machine-like. And the danger is machines don't know right from wrong. Okay. Thank you for hearing my talk. Thank you so much. That was super interesting. Um, I really appreciate all the different themes that came up there. Um, I've actually got a few questions, but I want to um, leave it to the audience to ask any. Um, do you guys have any questions for Julia? Any questions? Okay, I've got one. Um, my question is, you, you, you talk about um, the obvious cognitive effects that um, d using different types of technology can have on the human brain. Where do you think that the state comes into this? Um, um, because obviously a lot of this is at least like we perceive it as free will that I buy a phone so that I can talk to my grandmother. But where do you think that the line is drawn between kind of individual choice when it comes to using these technologies and then the state imposing them and then potentially collectively changing the mindset of a society? Well, today, the state and large corporations are, they work together, and they uh, supplement each other. And I think the role of the corporation and the, um, like the free market, which we don't have a free market, but even in a free market, this would be problematic. Uh, people think they're opting into things. But like I said, if you grew up on the internet from being a young kid, you are raised on that medium. And the messaging that goes through that medium, that is not something you can voluntarily like pick and choose between. You can't just filter out the good information from the bad information or the good programming from the bad programming, especially when you're very young. So... I mean, the obvious example here is all media is um, all the media that is very prevalent is at the end of the day empowered by the government because they can message through that media, like look at any election. And I think um, there was a previous talk where he talked where he said that this was always like this. So since the emergence of the printing pre press, people who had the most money and the most influence got the most information out there. Uh, today, it is more flat, so you do have more choice, but you're still going to be exposed to the preferable information because if you're using any kind of social media, that is what gets bumped up. And um, we can, obviously, we can talk about censorship, and many speakers have talked about that as well. But my main point would be that these kinds of powers become 
they merge together too. They're indistinguishable and a lot of their goals are aligned. And we are, again, we're not like, we're not um, voluntary consumers. Like they reach us in our homes and we have a, an illusion of choice, which is so much worse than actually having the choice. Um, and you can't, you can't even, like you can't even pick a point where that happens because I grew up online and I'm just used to doing things a certain way. And we all become extensions of our computers and of our uh, anything that we write online or do online. And I'm sure many of you who are my age probably regret a lot of things you did online uh, growing up because you didn't realize what you were doing and you didn't realize how it affected you in the long term and what, re what repercussions it could have. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, ah, there is a follow-up question. I'm not sure that the microphone can reach you, so you might need to come this way. Hello. Hi. Hello there. Oh, I'm here. Speak I'll come. Oh, sorry. I apologize. You don't need to see me, do you? Um, you can see I've got gray hair, uh, and I'm actually responsible, this generation is responsible for what my daughter of 25, and of course you look about the same age, um, uh, we are responsible for what is happening today. So what I've, I understand a lot of what you're saying, and I agree with a lot of what you're saying. The problem I've got is what is the solution? What is the way that we, the negative elements of what is what is happening, are um, prevented, preventing, uh, are prevented from stopping the next generation's difficulties? Because, you know, I'm an I'm an Englishman. I live in Prague, and this is my home. I've lived here for seven years now, and I want to continue here. In the UK, children are. I don't know if you've been to the UK in the last um, what, ten years or so. In the UK, the children are being being educated in prisons this is not mm -hmm. a joke okay i have many i have i have been and visited many times i have to go there every two months until recently and um they they can't even get out of the classroom to go to the toilet without putting a pin code in there this is a whole society and a whole generation that is being supposedly educated on technology they're not they're being given the tablets the screens and they're just left to do it so the problem I've got is nobody's coming up with the solutions. You know, I'm the one who should have created an artificial um, uh, PhD or whatever you like to call it, which says that m any mobile phone that is used by a ten-year-old, um, one set, one one millimeter from their from their brain, uh, should be banned. Is, is you know, that's the sort of solution that I should have come up with to stop the effects of the radiation to a young child's head by a mobile phone happening. So what I'm saying is, I'm sorry I'm taking a bit of time, but I hope I'm being understood um, in some way. Is there a solution to this? I'm sorry, I apologize uh, for taking so much time. No, not at all. Thank you. Um, yeah, and exactly. Uh, and especially with COVID now, I touched on this with, you know, allowing your relatives to die in the hospital alone. And it's okay, because you saw them on Zoom. The same thing is happening with kids now. Oh, they're on Zoom. They're learning. They're sitting in front of a screen for eight hours a day at home. And now they're trying to integrate them back into the classrooms. But a lot of schools aren't. Um, and you can't, you cannot teach a child, a small child, to read or write or do math, basic math over Zoom. You cannot do it, especially with boys. You have to sit down and teach them. You have to have physicality present. So we're going to have a whole generation of basically illiterate kids starting to grow up unless the parents step in. And that is my solution because you cannot you cannot limit the stuff like from a top down way, like unless the government literally bans the Internet, which I do not advocate for at all. I do not advocate for banning technology or putting laws in place. It has to start at home and it has to start from a, an objective set of morality. So that is my point here. Like. If we were becoming more machine-like and we we're integrated with all of this stuff, machines do not have, they do not know right from wrong. And we cannot base our morality on like the uh, PR firms of global corporations, like what they say, because their morality changes every five minutes. And that's kind of uh, how, what you can or cannot do or cannot say online, that is where that's coming from. Um, 
the government is actually less relevant with that in a lot of ways because we use the things on the internet more than we interact with the government. That's what's shaping our kids. So it starts at home. And like, I can give very pragmatic advice how to turn this around, uh, at least for your own family. And the problem is when not enough people do it, it's very difficult because your children are shaped by the peer group. So a lot of the tech people who are very into tech, like even Bitcoin core developers that I know, they have kids. The kids do not have their personal devices at all. They don't even have personal uh, online devices. The computers are in a public space within the home. Um, it's not that they're monitoring monitoring them, like sitting behind them the whole time, but it's it's understood that, no, this is not something you can just do whatever you want on. There are limitations. Uh, limiting the time spent online, making sure children are having physical contact with other children and other people, making sure you're sitting down and educating your children. I go as far as to, especially right now, to say homeschool your kids. Uh, because if I was a if I was a woman and my children, I am a woman, but if I was a woman in the position um, where my children were school age and I had a full-time job, I would quit my job and I would stay at home with them and teach them because to send them to a prison like you described the school system currently, I don't think that's a good um, way to assess long-term outcomes. <laughs> like don't, don't do that if you can help it. So it starts at home and starts with what is your fundamental objective morality and how do you, uh, and everything starts from there. Thank you so much. Um, any more questions? Because I have one more, but um, <laughs> I want to give you guys a chance to ask as well. 15 minutes. Cool. Right. Fine. I'll, I'll, I'll ask as well. Um, so uh, you, you mentioned, and I, I agree with you, that um, a lot of people who work in tech are actually the ones to limit the, the way that they use tech in the first place in their homes or like in their private lives. But at the same time, um, like the friendships and the relationships that these children foster are often only done through technology, like not, not only, obviously not exclusively, but they help them enrich their lives in the sense that they can become friends with people from other cultures that are 8,000 miles away and th things like that. Um, and it's not ideal. I, I realize that a lot of that is obviously um, has to be carefully curated. But what is your opinion on not ostracizing the kids from society by like removing them from this digital sphere, but at the same time protecting them, as, as rightly you said, by homeschooling them and giving them that extra physicality and attention that they need. Um, again, where do you think that the line lies here? Yeah, I just did a talk specifically on this topic um, at a Guns and Bitcoin conference like two weeks ago. And I talk about 100% community oriented living. So I'm not saying like live in a commune. I'm saying pick a place to set your roots and make sure your friends move there or move to a place where your friends and family are who all think similar to you. Because I'll give you an example. My my son has uh, a, neighbor, a neighbor and she's a little girl and they're like best friends and um, their family is not allowing them to play together without like a pool noodle, to, in the, a six foot pool noodle in between them. And she wears a mask the whole time. And my son had one interaction like this with her and came back fearful and didn't want to meet new people. So I don't want him to have friends like that because that influences my son in a negative way. And I also don't want to prohibit that because that's his friend. But so the long-term solution is make sure he has friends that don't put a six foot long pool noodle in between in between them when they play. That is what you have to do. So we are, uh, we, we've set roots on some land and we are actively encouraging our friends to move close to us. Uh, some have, and some of them are having kids. And I'm also actively seeking out other children around that have similar long-term goals as we do. And that way your kid isn't missing out on anything by having these limitations on whether it's technology or playing with people who are really scared and uh, fearful of the world. Um, so that's what you have to do. And the little girl, I talked to her and I was just casually asking her what she did all summer, how's school going? She's almost seven. She literally sat all summer on the computer playing Animal uh, Crossing. She didn't learn anything because 
I asked and we tried to do some math and some writing and she can't do any of it. Her mother is a teacher and her mother didn't bother sitting down with her all summer to do these things, to teach her own daughter. And she literally said to me, I'm very lonely. I want my mom to get an ultrasound to see if I can have a little baby. And it broke my heart. Um, but this is the state of the world. And I don't really want my son experiencing things that are that heartbreaking, in my opinion. So I suggest having a community and building it and growing it because that's the only way you're going to do it. And then at an age appropriate time, of course, you can introduce certain aspects of uh, being online and the machine. Of course, you can utilize things uh, in a more positive way when the child uh, is more ready for it and when you can have a reasonable conversation about the negative aspects of all this stuff. Awesome. Thank you so much. I actually have a fo follow up question on this um, regarding um, if you don't mind me asking schooling your son. Um, do, do you have a specific um, system in place? Like, is, is there any technology that you use to Frozen. maybe augment that or um, how do you approach this whole thing? Can you repeat the question because you froze when, right when you asked it? Sure. Can you can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. No, I'm just curious about um, if it's not too personal a question about how you actually school your, uh, your your son, whether you do use some kind of blend of technology or whether you have a very unique like approach that you, you just described. It's just I'm just curious about a little bit more detail. It sounds really interesting. Sure. I'm not a Luddite. Like um, I love video games still. Like my husband and I are both into that. Like we understand uh, that it's not fair to just completely take everything away. My rule for my son is if he's getting emotional about a video game or watching a movie, then he cannot, um, that is an, that is an, an unhealthy relationship beginning. So if I'm noticing that he's getting emotional about something, I say, okay, we're going to not do this for a little while and we'll come back to it. And when he gets to a point where he's not like wanting it all the time or getting emotional when he doesn't have it, that's like the key. That's what you want. And we're at that point with him. He's he's only four. So he gets to play a video game here and there. And it's like a fun reward. And like, you know, at the end of the day, he can do that. Um, I try to limit it to we don't even do it every day, an hour every other day, even less when we have a lot of stuff going on. And in terms of education, he's still quite young, but uh, we're bilingual. So I'm just educating him in um, Russian uh, every day. He does lessons, he does rep writing, he does uh, basic um, combinations of sounds to start him on reading. And he does, he's doing like double digit math with tables now. And honestly, it's not hard. They're so young. All you have to do is teach them math and reading and you just sit with, sit down with them for an hour at a time and do it. You don't even need a curriculum. Once they hit like six, seven, eight, then a curriculum would be helpful more for the parents. And there's like so many you can choose from. And I highly suggest you don't use apps because what happens with apps is they're smart. Okay. They will um, hack, they will hack the app. Like they'll, so some apps will have ans uh, questions and answers and they'll realize that you can just like try all the answers until you get it right. And then it's fun for them to just get it right every time. So they're not actually learning what they're doing. So I, I do not recommend apps for very young children at all, uh, especially in terms of writing apps. I have a preschool teacher, uh, preschool, first grade, and she had teacher, she had parents come to them and be like, why can't my son hold a pencil? Like he can write everything on his iPad. And she's like, this is different than this and that's like a whole pro different problem with kids they can't even hold a pencil to write like basic letters not even cursive i won't even start on cursive um they can't even hold a pencil because it's a di different motor skill they're just poking and dragging things that's different so i would really like i would not even give your kid an ipad until a road trip when they're like six i wouldn't do it because it starts it cascades a whole bunch of problems Thank you very much. Yes, there seems to be a follow-up question. Yeah, sorry, it's just this is a bit of a short call. Hello again. It's uh, um, I give you a, a example, two examples of what uh, I and my ex-wife did with um, uh, our daughter. Um, and don't forget, this was what, she's 25 now, so this was uh, 13 years ago. And we were able to do it then. 
uh, with education and we, we we understood many many things the first thing we did uh, it was i found a uh, a router which had a little bit of serve a, a little bit of software in it um, and it was quite unique that, that router allowed me to restrict the time that the uh, internet was on and off it also restricted me it allowed me to um, uh, identify individual ip addresses and to set times on and off days of the week etc cetera, etc cetera. so the first thing we did was we said well there's absolutely no way that anybody especially a 10 year old let alone a 13 year old needs the internet after midnight and before six o'clock in the morning so the whole thing went off now the first i'll give you an example what happened the first day that happened um uh it happened and of course um uh, our daughter uh, came in to uh, the bedroom uh, uh, and said, you've just turned off the internet. Now, one of the great things about third parties is that you can blame them. And if they're invisible, then the child especially can't have a little tantrum at them, can't pull their hair, can't jump and up and down and can't do anything at them. So I said, I'm terribly sorry, I haven't done anything. I've just bought this this software and it's just worked. And I'm terribly sorry, I can't do anything about it. That's it, you see. That's the role of a parent, in my view. Not a friend, a parent and somebody who cares. So she just accepted that because there was nobody, she couldn't get at me, she couldn't get at my wife, anything else like that. And so her life was exactly that way. And she was perfectly happy with that. And when her friends came around, no problem at all. The other part of it was the media of the television. So this was this was a unique piece of piece of software, uh, and what it did it, it stands between the the the, the um, what's it called the infrared remote. Sorry, I don't have a television. I haven't had one for fourteen years. The infrared re remote television. That doesn't mean I'm boring, by the way, or don't know what's going on. Uh, in fact, the opposite. Uh, and um, it stands between that and the TV. And what it does is it creates um, uh, a, a barrier between yourself, the user, and the TV. And what it did is we set up very simply accounts for each one of us. And we then set up timescales that we could then say we wanted all, especially the child. It was particularly for the child. Um, I didn't need to control my wife and she didn't need to control me. That's a bit of a joke, by the way. Um, and, and, um, but, but basically what we were doing, because we also had the same restrictions, that made it fair to all three of us. And so what happened was that she was then allowed a certain, every day, let's assume, to watch the television between, let's say, six o'clock and eight o'clock or something like that. I don't remember. Whatever the, whatever the hours were before she went to bed. And what happened, and, and it was a time scale, and what happened was that she became very, very, very discerning. And very, it taught her a lot of things. Because what it taught her is that she had two hours with watch to watch, which to watch that media. Even if she had two hours within a four or five hour scope of time that she was allowed. What she did is she looked at what the programs were on each of the channels. And she made a decision, a conscious decision, what she was going to watch and what she didn't watch. And that was really good education for her and, uh, and something she didn't get. Then the greatest benefit of all, because some of the channels were commercial with adverts, what then happened, especially with her, with her friends were around, what then happened was she realized that the time she wanted to watch the things that she wanted to watch and her friends wanted to watch, they were being, it, was being, it was being used by these crap adverts that were no use to her. So she used what she used to happen when the adverts used to come on. She turned the TV off to save the time, then turned it back on again. So those are two examples that you may not have heard of before. I don't know. I don't control. I don't. I don't. I call those that both of those elements caring and being a parent for your daughter or for your child for the future. And so I, I wish those two things would be part of virtually everybody's society personally but it's a parent's decision i understand so i don't know whether you I, I don't know if you have any comments whether you said i'm being i don't know um a communist or something like that um, i'm not of course okay sorry um yeah i'm gonna just i'm gonna end on saying that 
you have to have fundamental objective morality in your home and media is not outside of that. It has to be adhering to the same um, basic moral principles that you're teaching your kids at home. So a lot of parents, I've even seen this with homeschooling fundamental uh, religious parents, they have a certain set of values for everything except media and they'll just stick their kids on an iPad even if they're homeschooling them. Um, I think that's missing the mark. And if you guys want more of the morality side perspective, I have a playlist on my channel called it's the religion pr playlist. And I talk about objective morality and how to um, how to navigate through that if you're interested. But that's I didn't talk too much about that because that's its own speech. Um, but yeah, have your moral a foundation at home and as long as you're consistent uh your children will not tantrum or like try to uh work around it the consistency is what's is what keeps the tantrums at bay if you're flip-flopping and they they can manipulate you and get around it kids are very smart they will try everything but if you're consistent they will not try it because they know that um there's a foundation that cannot be breached this is awesome. And I think it's one of the beauties of multidisciplinarity that you come to a um, crypto anarchic Congress and actually pick up a lot of cool tips on parenting. So <laughs> I'm, I'm very excited about that. Um, uh, I've got maybe one last question because the, the theme of this Congress is digital totality. And I'm just curious uh, whether we take the metaphor of the parent child relationship and we bring it towards the state and the population and the use of technologies. Um, Again, like, what, what is your view on that, whether you see any parallels um, and whether from your line of work, you've got some experience that you'd like to share or any comments that you'd like to make on that front? Well, unlike parents who are hopefully actually care about their children, uh, the state does not, especially the current forms of government. They're based on short term um, democracy. So all politicians care about is serving their you know, short um, time in the government. They want the votes for that. And they'll only be concerned about the uh, high time preference results. They want the things to look and sound and feel good and beneficial and positive for the people in the short term so that they can uh, keep their power. And when everything explodes down the line, it's not their problem anymore and they don't care. And the system in it of itself is structured that way. Um, and this is why I'm still a huge advocate of Bitcoin because, you know, fiat money is a perfect example of this. Fiat money is a short term system that benefits those in power. Um, I am I'm I'm co-authoring a book about how Bitcoin is the most moral money. And we go into this uh, very much in depth. And anytime you have a system where the government only cares about high time preference and short term outcomes, you're not going to have a good system and they don't actually care about what happens to you down the line. So keep that in mind, um, whether as a parent, a parent um, child relationship, you do care about your children down the line. That is the most low time preference you can a thing you can do in your life because it takes a lot of time and energy and resources from you. And you're investing into your future generations that you will never even see. So I like to apply that mindset for everything in my life. And um, this is why democracy uh, is bad. And um, I think we should bring back a king <laughs> based on moral principles. So a God ordained king. But uh, you guys can harass me about that on Twitter. There's no time for that conversation either. No, I think you're in pretty good company for that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> an objectively moral king. That sounds that sounds like a challenge. You can behead comment. him. You can behead him if he doesn't adhere to God's law. That's the yeah, I, of it. I love that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a good it's a good approach. Well, maybe that's what the next Congress will be about. Um Paris <laughs> and the future of the monarchy. Um, who right. knows? That's right. right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, we're at time, but it was fantastic having you. All all the way here from Texas. Um, technology was good for this. I mean, I hope that my great course yes, has been increased because of this Zoom. <laughs> Thank you so much um, and stay Thank in touch. You. Thank you, bye. Thank you, take care.